Senators Tammy Baldwin and Debbie Stabenow are now co-chairing a hearing among Democrats about reining in corporate buybacks. Joining us right now is one lawmaker who has come out against this agenda. Republican Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania is here. And Senator, thanks for being with us today. Good morning, Becky. Good to be back. There's a lot of talk about corporate buybacks uh, yeah. from a lot of different places and people who think it's a bad idea. Uh, what do you say to that? Uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, a stock buyback is a perfectly reasonable and sensible way for a company to return some money to investors. And if a company runs out of viable investments to make and has cash above and beyond what they can successfully deploy, then they've got a responsibility to return it to investors. They could do it by a special dividend. But a stock buyback sometimes is better because you can decide as an investor whether or not to participate. So this is just a completely normal, sensible way that capital gets recycled in our economy, right? The money comes back to investors. What are they going to do with that? Uh, overwhelming majority of the time, it gets reinvested in a company that really needs the capital. So stock buyback is perfectly normal and healthy. And this assault on investors and share ownership, that's what's dangerous. You know, you, you're preaching to the choir here. I, I think we all agree with you. It's but not what, a close call. <laughs> what do you hear when you say that to your colleagues who have brought up these ideas, what, what do you get in response? Uh, there's not a cogent argument for this. I mean, some, some will suggest that somehow a stock buyback prevents capital expenditures. But of course, that's not true at all. The stock buyback is done with money after the, all the capital expenditures that are possible have been made. Uh, we've seen uh, record stock buybacks. At the same time, we've seen records of uh, capital expenditures. But, so clearly, it doesn't come at the expense of, I mean, uh, of CapEx. Nobody, uh, Senator, says Joe, no, it just, nobody's hit a, a course in this, I don't think. I mean, so, okay, buybacks are bad. Maybe we should legislate that you issue a bunch of more stock. If buybacks are bad, then yeah, the opposite. Yeah. Let's say uh, there should be mandatory issuances of we should dilute, we should, we should issue double the amount of outstanding shares. or. All private companies need to go public, or, or a, a public company can't buy back stock and eventually go private. It's all just commerce yeah. and capitalism, and it's or, what, it's what <laughs> managers, corporate managers decide to do to, God forbid, maximize profits and, and try to take on their competitors, which are now global. Exactly. And, 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 in the, in, and in the process, creating jobs and paying taxes. Exactly. And if you're going to do this, then uh, obviously people will shift to paying dividends, larger dividends, special dividends. So then what, are you going to ban dividends too? No, so but seriously, just, what, what, I, can you legislate that you need, if, if buybacks are bad, then legislate that you need to issue more stock, uh, look, more that, of a that, good thing. It makes that, no sense, that logically. That proposal might very well be on the way, Joe. This is what we're dealing it's with It's in the here. New Green Deal, I think. And, you gonna, and how so, are you going to vote on that? I'm, I'm gee, very concerned I, I, at my yeah, past. I'm really yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrestle with that one, Joe. I'm going to wrestle really, with that uh, one. I'm worried. But uh, seriously, the other thing that's amazing about this is that this lurch towards socialism is happening at this moment. The record strong economy, record low unemployment rates, really finally some strong growth in wages. CapEx continues to be really strong. What exactly is the problem we're trying to fix here? So, Senator, go back to, to the source of, of the catalyst, if you like, which is this notion that companies have been treated better, that they got a cash windfall of some sort, and there's frustration that it hasn't been reflected enough in higher business investment. If that is the issue, what else could you offer to encourage businesses to invest more? What does it take? So, you know, we've seen a huge surge in business investment. I think it's a response largely to a much better treatment of capital expenditure under our tax code. As you know, you can now fully expense that. That has clearly lowered the after-tax cost of investing capital. We've also lowered the return, uh, to the tax on the return on capital. And we have seen exactly what we hoped for, an investment-led recovery, a huge surge in CapEx. America is a really attractive place to invest. And as a result, we've got more job openings than people looking for work. And we've got wages growing at the fastest rate in a decade. So uh, th this is working. So uh, how many people see things your way in the Senate and in the House? And how many people? take the opposite view on this. How much more popular is this perspective becoming? I, you know, it's hard to say, Becky. Uh, we haven't had a vote on a specific policy, so we don't know for sure. I'm pretty sure the vast majority of my Republican colleagues understand that 
investors need to have ways to get their money back from an investment and they don't want the government to to ruin that uh, on the other side of the aisle I imagine they're they're mixed and divided but clearly there's been this increasing appeal of of socialist populism that uh, is leading to these kind of proposals uh, senator uh, you you just mentioned that you know the tax code had fostered uh, at least greater incentives for capital investment by companies. So therefore, we do use the tax code and regulation to try and encourage certain types of activities uh, and discourage others from companies. So short of any kind of a ban on a buyback, I wonder what you think about people saying, look, uh, if a company has an underfunded pension fund, maybe they shouldn't be able to repurchase stock. Maybe they shouldn't really, uh, we should look at executive compensation and how it might be linked uh, to things that could be helped by, uh, by buybacks. So obviously, we did at one point effectively have a ban on buybacks before 1982 or so, uh, so it's not unprecedented. But even short of a ban, are there ways to look at, uh, at corporate behavior and encourage different types? So I think our tax code should strive for neutrality, and I think expensing of CapEx is a step in the direction of neutrality rather than what can often be arbitrary depreciation schedules. It's a timing function of when you recognize the expense you've occurred, and when you allow full expensing, you're allowing that expense to be recognized at the time that it's incurred. You raise one issue that I do think ought to be thought of as a separate matter, and that is underfunded pension liabilities. And that's because there's a contingent liability on the taxpayers. So there's this exogenous factor in pensions that is not associated with, say, executive compensation or some other sort of ordinary part of, uh, of doing business. I mean, that, that does make sense. Would you support that? I think we have to take a hard look at that. If there's a company that has an underfunded pension and their liability is backed up by the pension guarantee uh, company and therefore taxpayers, that, that's a liability that, that we, we've got a right to say, well, if you're going to participate in that arrangement for the benefit of your workers, you know, you owe it to taxpayers to make sure that uh, you're minimizing the risk that that's going to, that that ticket's going to be punched. So I, I do think that's a separate category. We, we've heard that conversation. We've had that conversation with a few senators. Um, I don't know that anyone has actually gone about proposing it. Would yeah, you? I'm not. Um, it's it's something worth looking at, and and uh, I, I'm not I'm not aware of a specific legislative proposal, but we ought we ought to be thinking about that. Uh, Senator, in terms of the people who are coming before your committee, people who are going to be brought forth, is there anything that we should know about, uh, anything you're looking forward to? Because I have to say, I've been really impressed by the questions you've asked the people who have come before your committees. Uh, well, um, uh, this morning we've got a banking committee hearing on, uh, on housing finance, and I'm hoping that that'll be an interesting discussion because, as you know, the, the giant unfinished business of the financial crisis, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that we still have this bigger than ever duopoly that completely controls mortgage finance and so we've got a terrific new director of the regulator of those two entities Mark Calabria and uh, we really need to start having a substantive discussion about how we move away from the model we're in now. Fannie and Freddie you mean? Correct. That's been a conversation that's been taking place for over a decade at this point. Yeah but we've got somebody who really wants to move the ball forward. I think the Trump administration generally and Mark Calabria in particular and there's um, there's interest among members on the banking committee. I agree it's a really really hard nut to crack but uh, you asked about inter an interesting yeah. hearing. I think it's going to be a good I, one. I remember a few years ago they were still those two and uh, what's the third was it Sally Mae the three of them I think made up north of 90 percent of all mortgages that were taking place you really Shady think the private yeah. sector is, is, is up to the task if those totally go away? Uh, of course I mean ultimately it's private capital that ends up uh, you know making the investment um, the US capital markets can finance mortgages in America um, I, I, I'm not at all comfortable with the model we have right now uh, but a transition to a, a more competitive, more private market driven uh, approach, um, that's tricky. So, uh, you know, clearly that's been part of the reason that we haven't made much progress. Senator, um, you know, probably a good week for, for prospects for the GOP in 2020, some of the, the events that, that have occurred. It's been pointed out that now the Trump administration and the Justice Department is siding with the appeals court on the Obamacare. Uh, the entire uh, act, ACA, being uh, unconstitutional. It's been pointed out that that was, in some people's view, a losing argument for 2018, and that that's what caused some of the Republican losses was was uh, health care concerns. 
So you, you have this great victory and now you're, you know, now the administration's back to, to something that could cause people to be, uh, you know, you know you're, you're snatching defeat from the jaws of victory again. Or, or is, do you, can you work with Democrats? Will Democrats work with you on fixing this, health care? Uh, that's on the big, the big parts of Obamacare, that's pretty tough. But I, but I have to challenge the premise, Joe. Okay. Um, it's absolutely the case that health care was a big issue in the last election, and I do believe it didn't work well for Republicans. I don't think that's because we've opposed Obamacare. I think it's because many Republicans didn't have a good answer to how you're going to deal with the very real problem of people with pre-existing health problems, pre-existing conditions. And so conflating those two, people think, well, Obamacare is the solution for that problem. Um, that gave a lot of political strength to uh, Democratic arguments, but of course it's not the case. There's lots of better ways to help people who are dealing with pre-existing conditions rather than this, you know, ginormous government takeover of a very big part of health care. So we've got to do a better job articulating alternative ways that people that keep the freedom and flexibility and ownership of your own health insurance policy, lower costs because you've got more options, can buy what you wish and not what, what is mandated. Those kind of things together with the government backstop on pre-existing conditions. I think that's a better approach, and, and I, I don't think the, the well, recognition that Obamacare is unconstitutional you, is, is inherently a problem. I'll go as quick as I can. We think China might, some people are speculating they might be more willing to deal with the president, that maybe he's in a strengthened position. Nancy and Chuck, are they more or less willing, do you think, at this point, to try to find some common ground after this has become... You know, maybe it's off the table now. Can you do anything in the next two years? You would hope. Like, we've got a test right in front of us, right? We have not agreed upon total spending levels for this fiscal year. So without an agreement on spending, well, I mean, we've got statutory agreement, but at very, very low levels that nobody thinks you can pass any appropriation bills. So we need an agreement in order to just do the funding of the government. This is something that has to be bipartisan. We'll, we'll see if our Democratic colleagues want to work and get a solution so that we can responsibly fund the government over the course of these next few months. Senator, we're really out of time, so I'll ask for a quick response. Sure. But back to stock buybacks very quickly. I yeah. want to read this tweet that came in. It's, it's not the buybacks are bad. It's that cutting corporate taxes to provide for corporate buybacks leads to rising inequality. It then goes on to suggest that you and Joe and I should maybe have our driver's license revoked because clearly we don't drive uh, very clearly. Uh, but <laughs> it, it's a valid point. It's what you're hearing from the other side. So what do you respond to that, that the tax so, cuts led to this? So first of all, I do. I think tax cuts did contribute to this, which is a very good thing for the economy. We're getting capital more rationally allocated, which means more growth, which is part of the reason why wages are growing at a 10-year record high. One of the ways you reduce income inequality is you have an acceleration of wage growth, which is exactly what's happening right now, and it's fastest in the lowest earning categories. So I just, I just disagree with that analysis. And it sounds to me like, you know, the government let these guys have more money, more, let them keep more of their own money. You know, and it's like uh, the, the government deigned to allow them to have a little bit more. Yeah, and it was like, done for competitive reasons around the globe so that we and, can compete with the and same it's taxes. working. And, and, and it's working. And repatriation and everything yes. else. So yes. uh, I, I think I drive fine. Actually, I think in the next segment, <laughs> uh, I'm a damn good. Show? I'm a, We're going to show the video. An excellent driver. Senator Toomey, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, man. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs>